Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Vince, and I've been doing admissions since 1989 and college counseling since 1998 in California. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a wellness coach at the Kenan Flagler Business School at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I'm so blessed to be able to work alongside both my beautiful daughters at School Match for You, a college counseling firm that I founded in 2010. Good morning, friends. I'm coming to you from California for the last time in the foreseeable future. I'm coming to you from Koreatown, close to downtown LA by the convention center after having an absolutely sensational NACAC conference. And today I want to just start with a few thank yous, say a couple words about the NACAC conference. I have a tip that I just need to share because it's time sensitive with you today. And then uh, I'm going to do what I promised I would do, something a little fun. I'm going to categorize some of these schools that I visited and tell you which ones stood out to me in in different categories. Uh, But let's start out with our thank you. So I I have to thank Stacey Boodman, Eunice Choi, and Leanna Premiera, just because they all hosted events for you're a college-bound kid that were sensational. They were so much fun. Um, very, very kind of them to do that. And I also have to thank all of our listeners who came out. It was so fun to meet you. I have to thank everybody for the incredible hospitality you've shown me on this trip. Um, they talk about Southern hospitality. Well, California, you are everything to match that. So many people treated me to lunch and breakfast and just were so kind and just made this a a very extremely memorable trip. Uh, And I am most grateful. I want to say a a few things about the NACAC conference. Now, you're going to be hearing me say a lot about NACAC. NACAC, of course, an acronym for the National Association of College Admission Counseling. It is our annual conference. It's a meeting of admission professionals and also college counselors, all types, CBO, public school, college counselors, private school, college counselors, independent educational college counselors. This is the best NACAC I've ever been to. It was amazing. I'm going to be taking several weeks. It's probably going to be three to just bring you highlights, some of the trends, leading trends. What's the buzz? What's everybody talking about in higher ed? Um, But I'm going to save that for a few, um, the next few weeks. I also want to get together and talk to Susan. Um, who, you know, was here, Vince was here, but only briefly, I'm going to talk to, talk to both of them and get their, you know, their insights, come back and share with you some things. I I've written down about 10 myself already that I want to share with you, but that's for next week. The thing I want to share about this week is, you know, we have so many listeners who love this work. How do I know? Well, I, can see it by, you never miss an episode. I see it by the depth and substance of the questions that you ask. I see it because, you know, when I when I put out a request, do, do you guys want to help an under-resourced student, you know, in the college counseling process? Like so many of you volunteered and you told me you volunteered and you got your student and the organization reached out to me and said, you have no idea how many volunteers came from your podcast. And then you guys tell me how much you love this work. Well, I'll tell you a brief story. The first time we ever did a, a meet and greet for your college bound kid was at SACAC in March of 2024. And one of the people that came to our event was coming from New England. I'm like, did you come all the way from New England? And what he said was, well, I'm thinking about maybe a career in college counseling. So I signed up for the SACAC conference. And said I'd come over here to to support the event, you know, your cause about Ken. And I'm coming to the SACAC conference to to see if maybe this is something I may want to do for uh, either a career change or, or maybe something on the side. And 
I'm telling you that the NACAC conference would be really good for some of our listeners. So I'm just going to put a little bug in your ear. Columbus, Ohio, September 18th through 20th, 2025, giving you almost a year heads up notice. You don't have to be a college counselor or an admission professional to go to NACAC or SACAC. In fact, Leanna, who stayed with, she signed up for the conference. She looked at those workshops and said, there's some great stuff here. So I just want to put that little thought in your ear. I know it takes resources, both time and money to do something like this. Um, and I know it's not for everybody. But if you are like an admissions junkie and you can't get enough of this stuff, take a look at the workshops. And, you know, one thing that they're, they're doing now to make NACAC so much better in the past, like if you sign up for the NACAC conference, you know, and you, you go and you pick a slot, right? And there'll be like 16 choices every session. There's like five sessions throughout the conference and you have like 16 options. So you look at your, your program and you're like, but I want to go to like five of them. So they used to make you have to also buy the audio package, which is kind of a little frustrating. You know, you, you've spent money for the conference and the hotel air, airfare, rent a car meals on top of the conference fees. Well, now they're bundling in the audio package with your conference fee. And also in the past, even when you got like the audio package, it used to be like 30 days and it expired. You can't watch all that stuff in 30 days. I was talking to one of the leaders from NACAC because he was telling me, no, you get it until December 20th now. And he told me, you know, we just switched to a whole different vendor that had much better technology. So, you know, you not only get the conference but you get like two and a half months to watch all the sessions you wish you could have attended. All right. You guys are going to start thinking I'm a huckster for NACAC. Like, what's is this some side hustle? You're getting some kickback? No, not at all. Just trying to, to share a resource that um, I think would be amazing. And everybody and everybody comes to this thing. So, you you know, I, I'm serious. Of all the people I've interviewed on this podcast in the World of College Admissions, 80%, 80% 90% of them are here. So it's pretty awesome. So just a little word about NACAC. Now, I have to share a tip for you. So this tip is for seniors. Well, it's for everybody, but it's really time sensitive for seniors. So in the past, you know, I've talked about one way to attack or approach your college list is to bucket your schools, right? You bucket your rolling admission, early decision, early action schools into one category because they're all going to have you know, deadlines, you know, anywhere up to December 1 at the latest. And, you know, and then with rolling admissions, I can be submitting them in August. And then included in that would be things like the UCs that technically don't have early action or schools like, you know, University of San Diego. They don't have early action, but, um, you know, you really want to be getting that in, you know, you have to get it in, in their deadlines, you know, that is going to be like a, you know, a deadline before the January timeline, right? So I've said bucket those schools all together. Anything really that's got a deadline of like December 1st or sooner. And then you can take on your your regular decision schools later. But I want to recommend you look at a third category. And this is take a look at early action schools that have December notifications. So I know this gets confusing and I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about how confusing it is. Um, attended an amazing session on on why is this process so complicated. And I want to I want to share some stuff from you know with you guys about that in another date. But when you look at early action schools, and for those of you who confuse early action and early decision, which is very easy to do, and most people I would say confuse those. Right? Early action, early deadline, early notification date, non-binding. Have until May first to decide. But what you find is they come in lots of flavors in terms of when they notify you. That early notification is not always early. There are some early there are some early action schools that give you an early action deadline of like November first, and they don't notify until February. And to be honest, I'm not saying not to apply to those schools because if you like them, apply. But here's where it's not that helpful compared to your December notifiers. When you have your early action schools that notify in December, you literally have the ability to take a look at where you've been admitted and then make some decisions about, do I even want to apply to some of these January schools? 
Because if I get in a school that's got an early action December notification or UGA November, then I can look at them and, and sometimes say, you know what, I kind of like these schools more than some of these other January schools. And then I can really reduce my workload significantly. So my tip is be on the lookout for some early action schools that give you the December notification. It's very user friendly and it really can actually reduce your workload because you can not apply to as many January schools. In addition to have that peace of mind, hopefully of getting some acceptances and we get those acceptances in under your belt, of course, it's, you know, it's fantastic, right? So um, that's my tip for the day. So I'm now gonna transition to something that I've never done before, but I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. And then after that, of course, we'll continue. I never mentioned this before, but you know, we will continue our interview with Aaron Wolf. Uh, looking at 17 reasons why college aid offers are all over the place. Last week, we covered weeks one, uh, reasons one through four. We'll pick up with reason five. So I forgot to mention that in my intro. All right, let's go to something that I'm having some fun with. Uh, but before I do it, I have to give caveat, 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 caveat. Uh, by the way, I hope my audio is okay because I travel with two laptops. And one is way, way, way better for sound quality. And, but it's older, and sometimes it's uh, a little glitzy, and it was acting up this morning, so I'm using my secondary one. So it is what it is. I'm in, in the hotel trying to make it happen. All right, so before I share what I'm going to share, I have to give a bunch of caveats. I'm going to share my impressions from my visits. And I've bucketed these schools into categories, but I have to say this. This is my impressions. It's only my impressions from spending three to four hours on these campuses. Please, 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 please don't take this as gospel. It's designed to be a little more fun and lighthearted than it is to be like etched in stone and granite and permanent, right? These are my impressions, you know, of these schools. But before I do, I want to share something. So last week I shared how, isn't it weird how when you go to a college and you're there for 30 minutes and after three hours, your impression is almost the same as it was after 30 minutes? So do you know the next three schools I visited, I saw a shift. That's right. I spent a half a day at Loyola Marymount, LMU, on the 23rd, half a day at USC on the 24th, and a full day at UCLA on the 25th. Now, these were NACAC trips. So NACAC also does college tours. That's another reason to come to NACAC. They have college tours link to the conference you sign up for the tour and you go with the group it's a lot of fun usually have a meal and just get to meet a lot of college counselors but anyway so all three of these schools Loyola marymount usc ucla if you were to ask me just personally once again i'm reading i'm visiting for my students to figure out who the best student to send kids to for my students right but i'm a human i can't help but have my own eye all three of them, the first half an hour, I would have felt, they all felt like they were B plus. It was like a B plus in my mind. Not only, only talking about how much I liked the place, but by the end of the visit, all of them were A's. So I don't want to make it sound like no school ever moves at all. Because all three of those schools were like a fine wine for me. The longer I was there, the more I was liking them. So I just want to kind of add that to what I, to what I said last week. All right. Um, one other caveat about this. I'm going to see 20 schools on this trip. Um, this is just based on 16 because I still am going back to USC. In fact, after I record this, I'm doing a couple of counseling sessions and then I'm meeting four students at USC. And then I'm going to uh, Caltech and then I'm going to Harvey Mudd and then I'm going to Occidental, busy day. <laughs> These are all meeting students, by the way. And then I'm spending a half day at Redlands uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, and also, and Cal Lutheran. So, so those schools will not be in here. Some of them would be. I might throw a couple in just because I was just at some of these like less than two years ago. Um, honestly, and some of them I, I know, you know, I could easily throw into these categories, but I'm trying to keep this little game I'm playing based on this trip. All right, so I think it's easier for me just to dive in and tell you the categories and the Grammys, who gets the awards for this trip. All right, 
probably the hardest one. I'm starting with the hard one, getting the hardest one first out of the way. Most beautiful campus. Oh my goodness. This is so hard because so many campuses are just gorgeous in the state. Then I have like seven that I have listed here. And I know I would have nine. I would have 10 if I counted the ones I'm about to visit and visit my students because I was just at those schools and they would, I can think of three that would definitely be on the list. So let me go through the schools and then I'm going to force myself to pick one, which is going to be really, really, really hard. But I've been thinking about this a lot. All right, here are the ones that stood out to me. University of San Diego, University of Southern California, Santa Clara University, Loyola Marymount University, University of San Francisco, Santa Cruz, UCLA, UC Berkeley. Those to me were the most beautiful schools that I visited. Now, if I was doing this counting through today, because I was just at these places, I know I'd have to also say Occidental, Caltech, and Redlands, because I was just at those places like 19, 20 months ago, but they weren't on this trip. So those would be in there. And I didn't even put Santa Barbara, a beautiful place, and many others, right? But those ones, they're just to me, they're all beautiful, just gorgeous. But I'm going to force myself to pick my favorite. It's the University of San Diego. That place is spectacular. But once again, this is like an art painting. You might have a different view if you were to do it. Okay, now I got the hardest one out of the way. Now I'm going to go to the next one. Work is extremely hard. All right, work is extremely hard. Definitely, you see Berkeley. Berkeley, the students definitely talked about how hard the work is. Stanford, you know, I, I met with one of my students there. You now he's a CSAI major. And he said that he came out of an exam, the average grade was a 47 in the class. All right, 47. And he said, I got a 49. And I was happy that I beat the curve. All right. And then next, I would say UCSD. But especially for STEM majors there, and there are a lot of them. But if I was counting my visits in December, I would definitely put Caltech on that list for sure. In fact, I would even put it ahead of Berkeley um, and Stanford. It would actually get the top award if I count my last time I was here. But on this trip, Berkeley, Stanford, UCSD. All right, largest classes. So there's kind of one school in its own league here. I'll put my runner up, which is UCI. Um, but, and this is just based on me talking to students and asking what their largest classes were. UCI, UCSD, we're kind of tied for second. But clearly the number one is Berkeley. It's the number one of any school I've ever visited any time in my life in the country. I'm not kidding. I know you think I'm exaggerating. But I was talking to a student, and I said, what's the largest class you've ever had here? And the student says to me, 1,700 kids. I said, 1,700? They point to me to the building right where they had the 1,700 class. I'm like, how do you fit 1,700? They said, well, auditorium holds like six to 800, and then Hundreds more sit on the floor, and then they stream it in. And when they stream it in, you get a real close-up right out of the professor's face. A lot of people just stay home and just watch the streaming version. So all told, 1,700 in the class. Then I'm talking to another student. What's the largest class you've had here? 1,600. So the highest answer that I heard at any other school was 600. So Berkeley's kind of in its own league on the largest class award. All right, most sports school spirit. All right, I could not differentiate USC and UCLA. They are tied for number one. I'm not trying to be PC. I know it's a big rivalry. I'm not siding in the rivalry. I just couldn't tell which one had more, but they were both oozing school spirit. You know, not quite like SEC level, not quite like going to a place like Tennessee, which is ridiculous for school spirit, but it was crazy. 
there was so much energy and it was a lot of it. And I liked that a lot personally. So I really liked it a lot. It was really great to see USC, UCLA. You know, you really don't get it a lot in California schools compared to Big Ten country or SEC country or ACC country. For those of you who don't follow sports, you know, these are major sports conferences, Big 12 country. But USC and UCLA, yeah, they were they were they were really excited about the games and talking about how much fun they were and they were fired up. In fact, I told you I'm on my way to to USC um, in a couple hours to meet four students. I was supposed to meet one of them yesterday. He's like, he's like, Stuck, I found out that three o'clock we were supposed to meet. Guess what? USC's play was Wisconsin. Can we change that? So yeah, yeah. And this is somebody who um you know, wasn't even a sports guy before he got there, but he caught the bug. Anyway, so who else is in the most school spirit award winner contest or category? St. Mary's. Little small St. Mary's 2000 undergraduate students in Morego. They had a lot of school spirit because they're division one. And so a lot of students I talked to there commented on that. They commented on how it's a small school, but it feels bigger. And there's all the energy around sports, and we love that. And, um, you know, before I had visited St. Mary's, all I really knew about St. Mary's, besides the fact that they were Catholic in small division one, was I would, most years, I'll watch St. Mary's when they play, you know, when they play uh, Gonzaga, you know, and basketball, because they're big rivals. So, yeah, they definitely had a, a, a decent amount of school spirit. Not USC, UCLA level, but they definitely get the the third spot and the fourth spot san diego state san diego state sdsu those are the four schools that showed me some athletic school spirit usc ucla tied st mary's next sdsu next the one school that had a little bit more than i thought i don't think of this as a big school spirit place and it really isn't but I got a little bit more out of Santa Clara than I was expecting. Now, part of that's because they beat Gonzaga this year in a game that went down to the last second. Everybody stormed the crowd. I mean, this, the crowd stormed the floor, and the students were telling me how fun that was. I never thought I would even hear that at Santa Clara. But, um, you know, it, it, it's easy to have school spirit when you're winning. <laughs> it really is the one you're getting your head handed to you. You're getting pummeled. All right, next category. Students are concerned about crime. All right. So for this, Berkeley, Riverside, then there's a big drop off. USC comes next. And it's not really on campus. It's more, it's South Central. Like it's right in South Central. It's more like on the, on the, you know, on the outskirts of the campus. And then after that, there was a little bit at UCLA, but that really surprised me because I didn't feel it at all. I didn't feel it at all at USC, but, you know, I didn't feel it at Berkeley either, but people were like, yeah, do you know there was a shooting on campus? And they were talking about, I knew about the homeless, of course, the homeless problem, but, you know, a lot of students were describing sort of the mental instability of the homeless population. And I'll get more into this when I get into the individual breakdowns of these schools, if you guys are interested in them, but. There was definitely a lot of crime consciousness at Berkeley and Riverside for sure. And then, you know, big drop off, but USC a little bit, UCLA a little bit. Nobody else really had much at all around crime. Friendliest students. Friendliest students. All right. This goes to the University of San Diego, USD. Very friendly students. And then a large school, UCLA. Those students were very friendly. And then SDSU, San Diego State University. All right. Clearest description of your mission. University of San Francisco gets the award. And I've heard many presentations from them over the years. They are always so crystal clear about who they are. It is so refreshing to see a school that is so clear about who they are. So, and I've never not seen it from them. I give that award to University of San Francisco. And then the second one, UCLA. They were so clear about who they serve and what they're about. So they get the top two awards. All right. Students report an active party life. Okay. This one goes to San Diego State University. They like to party and have some fun. And then the second one would be University of California, Santa Barbara. 
All right, next award, students seem wealthy. All right, not surprisingly, three private schools get this award. You know, USC, Chapman, Santa Clara, and Stanford. So four private schools, USC, Chapman, Santa Clara, Stanford. Okay, hardest to get in. Stanford, UCLA, Berkeley, USC. Here's some UCLA stats. 1% admit rate in nursing, 1%. 4% admit rate in film, that's one out of 25 kids. 4% admit rate in engineering, one out of 25 kids. 4% admit rate for architecture, one out of 25 kids. Obviously nursing, one out of 100 kids. So, you know, I'm going to have a lot more to say about this with a lot more depth when I get into talking about individual schools. If you guys pick some of these schools, we're going to start giving you the option of picking schools that you want spotlights on. I'll get way more into details of how they do admission and different things I've learned. Their in-state admit rates versus out-of-state and all that stuff. All right. Concern about finances. This is I'm personally concerned about the school's finances. All right. And that would be Point Loma and St. Mary's, the two small schools on the list. All right. I'm going to speed up. I could say so much more about these, but I don't want to make, I try to keep Monday episodes shorter. Best views. So you got the vista, you got the views. Man, there are a lot to pick here. And I'm going to go with Point Loma. I mean, literally 75% of those dorm rooms have an ocean view. And when you talk to the students all the time, why do you come here? Like, you know, <laughs> it's the surfing and the views of the ocean. Okay. USF, I mean, beautiful views overlooking San Francisco. Really beautiful. Different kinds of views, right? And then Cal Poly, you know, and then you see Santa Barbara. So those are my awards for best views. Kids felt driven. Berkeley, Stanford, University of California, San Diego. Students said it was difficult to get classes. Berkeley, number one. UCLA, number two. UCSD, number three. Now, even that Berkeley was number one, it was at UCLA that I had multiple conversations with students of what they call the black market. The black market. So here's how the black market works. Actually, it works two different ways. There's the paid version and the free version. The paid version is someone does a side hustle. And they offer to drop a class so you can get in the class. So you make plans, right? And you might do it really late at night. And one person's right by their computer, and you're by your computer, and you drop, and they immediately click to add as soon as it goes up, and they hope nobody beats them. And some people are doing it for a side hustle, getting paid. But most people said that they don't do it for a side hustle. They kind of just help a friend out. You know, you got enough classes to graduate. I kind of don't really need this class. You know, sign up for it in advance, and they help a friend drop it, do the whole drop ad thing. They actually spoke about it. Um, and said that it is not sanctioned at all. Students can can encounter severe recrimination if um, they are caught doing this. So this is not something that is encouraged at all, and they're very much aware of it. But students thinking, how are you going to find out? So there's a black market for classes at UCLA, but still, I still give the word to Berkeley because I had more students complain at Berkeley than UCLA about the difficulty getting classes. And class sizes, you know, UCLA told me the biggest class they had was, was 300, which was actually the smallest number for, for the large schools. But anyway, difficult getting classes, Berkeley, UCLA, UCSD. All right. And, and then the UCSD would, I would have put, I would have even put them right up there higher for specifically for STEM. Some of the people like in the bio and chem, when you would talk to them, they complain the most about the difficulty of getting classes at UCSD. All right. Frats and sororities play a large role in the school. 
One school stood out for me for this, San Diego State University. Mouse, most outdoorsy. Boy, two schools stood out for me here. Of course, Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz. It's in a forest. All right. And then Cal Poly. Cal Poly. Okay, school felt really big. UCSD, University of California, San Diego, San Diego State University, UCI, University of California, Irvine. Best info session. No question, in a category of its own, UCLA. They really do an info session well, and I love a good info session. And a good info session for me, it really gives you a lot of tips about the school, tips about applying unique things you're not finding on the websites, unique things about culture, really good stats and data. Their, their transparency was amazing. And then Chapman, second. All right. Diverse. Felt really diverse. University of San Francisco, for sure. Okay. University of California, Santa Clara, UCLA, UCI, and for the private schools next to San Francisco, especially for a school of that level of wealth, USC. Not diverse. St. Mary's. And for the public schools, Cal Poly. And the last one, no, two last ones. Sleepiest town, St. Mary's. Marengo was really sleepy. And I, you know, I would spend time in the town, driving around, checking it out. And then talking to the students, there really was not much to do there. In fact, students would say that, yeah, when we want to get, a, get away, we go to Walnut Hill, which is really 10 miles away. That's kind of a little far when you're busy at school. You want something close. And then the nice thing, though, is San Francisco, Berkeley, and Oakland, all like within 30 miles. And I actually went from St. Mary's straight to Berkeley, and I really made it. Probably took me about 27 minutes. But still, that's that's not bad for weekends, but it's... You know, it's not a lot right around there. That was, that was definitely the sleepiest town for me. And then I'm going to close with this. Students were happy. All right, this is hard because there's a lot of choices here. Um, but I'm going to only pick one because there's a lot. And I have to give it to UCLA and the Bruins. Every single student that I talked to, and I talked to a lot of them. They were really, really happy. So they get the award. Students were happy. UCLA. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Uh, we'll now transition to my interview with Aaron Wolf. And she'll talk about 17 reasons why eight awards are all over the place at different schools. All right. Listen and enjoy. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Brands part two is going to really get deep in the weeds on how financial aid works as Aaron continues to give reasons why if a student gets in six colleges with money, the financial aid awards are all over the place. Aaron shares what assets are counted in the asset portion of the student and parent contribution. Aaron talks about reason five of why aid awards are all over the place, how the FAFSA and the CSS profile the two forms that are often required for financial aid are different. Aaron explains the differences between these two forms. Aaron explains why some colleges require the profile and some reasons why other schools opt not to require the profile. Aaron explains reason six, how some colleges require the non-custodial profile and how some colleges are very strict about requiring it and some colleges are much more generous about providing a waiver. Aaron explains reason seven and it's a major factor how there are different policies at how colleges factor home equity into the assets of the family that are used in the financial aid calculations. We get into the weeds, but that's why you listen to your college-bound kid. Listen and enjoy. In regards to assets, you know, on the parent side, we're really only looking at just under 6% of that value that a parent's reporting is actually calculated toward their asset component of the calculation. Um, and then um, for students, 
on the federal side, it's really 20%. Sometimes on the um, institutional side, they might look at 25% or maybe a school is doing something even a little, you know, more that they're looking a little harsher on the student assets. Um, again, school specific. So, um, but again, assets are, it doesn't hurt you to save money. Um, you know, again, because most of the, um, the calculation is going to be driven by the income part of things. But, you know, we can get into the differences between profile and FAFSA, probably maybe further into some of these questions, but there will be some differences and things that you're going to see as questions related on the applications for financial aid that are revolving around assets. But I will tell you that schools may be using that information for not necessarily as a negative or um, impact against the students of war, but it might be more informational um, as we're developing our four-year long-term strategy for supporting the student also while they're on campus. Yeah. So friends, when Aaron says 6%, that means if, if somebody had $100,000 in the bank, then 6000 of it would be expected to go toward college, you know? And so why don't you let our listeners know what are the things that fall under that asset category? Sure. Assets, I mean, all over the place. And I will tell, um, you know, those things would certainly not be your retirement account. So 401k, 403b, a pension, um, the FAFSA, that's something you want to make sure you don't list on there. However, on the CSS profile through the college board, those are questions you're going to see on there. Um, and I will tell you, you know, the reasons we look at it is for number one, informational purposes, like what assets do people have, but also um, because we were a school that collects FAFSA and profile data, we sometimes have what's called conflicting information. So we want to make sure that parents aren't double counting assets, um, are not providing us with, you know, information related to their retirement on their FAFSA. So we catch a lot of those things because we have the two different applications. But assets would also consist of 529 plans, your mutual funds, your stocks, you know, a second real estate property or a cabin in the woods. If you have something beyond your main residence, um, and it's important to say your main residence is not necessarily counted for, that's not listed on the FAFSA, the CSS profile will ask certainly for the purchase price and try to get at what the market value of that is. And we'll talk about home equity in a bit. But we certainly want to capture information related to business assets um, if you have a farm and certainly if you, like I said, have other properties, rentals and whatnot. And trusts would be in there yeah, as trust well. Would be, yeah, I, I will say in my years, I've only seen a few, but they do exist for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know I had it a little bit further down when I sent you an outline um, about the profile versus FAFSA, but it, it feels like we should jump yeah, we ahead to that because we're, yeah, yeah. we're it keeps, keeps coming it. up, right? And I have a feeling that some people are like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? about? Yeah. yeah. So why don't you talk about the two different methodologies, the two different forms, and why schools, some schools like Bucknell and others that have some endowed resources, you know, want to require both forms to be submitted? Sure. Um, so the FAFSA, that is going to be required by most all schools in the country for financial aid, specifically for federal financial aid eligibility, but some a very large majority of schools will use that then to determine their own institutional funds um, if they have any available. And so they're not necessarily asking for additional applications. There are several hundred schools in the country, though, that also require the College Board profile. Um, and that application um, is, is there, there's, a, there's a couple different reasons why schools use that, and I hope I can um, do my best to, to share the reasons why I, why I find the information um, helpful. Um, with the, the College Board profile, um, beyond the same questions that are coming from the FAFSA based on income, so of course all the FAFSA questions are going to be related to your adjusted gross income, your taxes paid, um, you know, some basic asset information, that data that's going right to the IRS, right into the FAFSA is going to also be reported on the College Board, so um, we can't pull from the College Board to the IRS, so families are going to have to input that data right from their from their tax return. But the, the profile will allow the family to tell us a little bit, you know, additional information about what's going on. So we can, we will know who else lives in the home. Um, the fact is just telling us a number based on dependents. Um, and we also can learn about um, perhaps if you have other children in college, 
where are they going? What year are they in college? Um, how much are they receiving in financial aid? Um, if you have students who might be in secondary education that you're paying a tuition for, that information can be provided to us as well. Um, there's an ability for families to list information related to additional medical expenses that may be above and beyond kind of what the standard would be for, for most um, families. Um, there's, you know, we're going to collect a lot of asset information on the CSS profile. We also have families, they'll, they'll tell us, um, in forms of financial aid, we're using what we call prior prior year data. So for anyone who enrolled um, in college right now for fall of 2024, we use 2022 data. And so when you are looking ahead to um, the CSS profile, we have families who can tell us what income may be um, the next year and the following year. So if a family member might be planning to retire, like we can see that they might be estimating income is going to drop. And that might be important to me as I'm trying to understand, again, because I'm using a, a base year income, like what else is going on that I may not be aware of that maybe we should be following up for additional information or just understanding what else is happening. Um, also with the CSS profile, there's a free form section where families can tell us that additional information we, they, they may want to share with us. So they may be sharing information related to an upcoming retirement, um, a job loss, um, or, you know, something related to um, any other any other information that they deem important in terms of us putting together a financial aid application. And then that allows us to have that ability to open up a conversation with the family as well. And we may look at the application and decide we need additional information from the family to better determine the financial aid award just based on what they've told us. Would it be fair to say that a major reason why the majority of schools don't require the profile is they just don't have significant institutional uh, need-based aid to, to give away. So to go through this complex assessment and to, you know, to find all this out is not really that relevant if you don't have the dollars to be able to address the need. Yeah, I would say that's a very fair assessment of why some schools wouldn't use it. Um, you know, it's also, you know, depending on the size of the staff that can work through the applications. I mean, when we're processing thousands of applications, you know, there's a lot we're reviewing too, but, you know, it's, it will depend and some schools may choose to, you know, only offer that a family complete it for the first year and then they don't require it year over year. So schools may, may be asking for certain information at some point during that time that the student's looking at the school, but then not require that into the future. And do you think that is that mostly done for manpower, the staff, but also not trying to be too onerous to the families completing it? Yeah, I would say, you know, we have to, we want to be careful. Um, you know, I always think of what, what do we really need to know to make our decisions and to mm-hmm. be fair. Um, but I also am careful that I don't want to be a barrier to a student certainly completing the process for financial aid, because especially if there's, you know, um, not a lot of assistance um, for a student or or, pay, or a family just is afraid to ask questions, you know, we don't want to seem burdensome, but yet we want information that we can can use to make the best and put out the best financial aid award immediately to the family. So we're we're, we're being the best version of, of what we present to the family right up front. All right. Let's come back to that later because I have some specific questions later about how different schools use profile differently than others. But let's talk about non-custodial parent. Sure. Well, you can tell our our listeners what the non-custodial parent is. And the question here being, I've seen some schools are a lot stricter on their policy of we're not waiving this non-custodial parent profile when it may seem difficult for a family to be able to get that information. And then other schools have more generous policies or more lenient policies. So that in and of itself could create a huge difference in an aid award because in one case, one parent's income is not factored into the equation at all. But talk to us about that. Yeah, that's a really great, great question. And, you know, I will say that's one every financial aid session. That's the first question we get is, do you look at non-custodial parent? And um, from the federal government side of, um, you know, looking at the FAFSA application, the, the, the non-custodial parent is not accounted for during the financial aid process. You know, 
the school may have some other method if they want to know something related to non-custodial that they might have a form or something that could be separate from the process of the FAFSA. But for schools that are using College Board Profile, many many of us are also looking at the non-custodial parent because in the grand scheme of things, um, it's you know we view things as a partnership with our family. So institutionally, we can do X, Y, and Z to the, to provide to the student, but in reality, the parents, um, you know, the lion's share of you know the family contribution is coming from parent A and parent B. Um, if parent the non-custodial parent is in the picture, um, we are definitely going to want to have the, that parent fill out a non-custodial um, profile so we can learn kind of the financial strength of the entire family unit. And I think that's what it comes down to. And you are correct; some schools are going to be. Uh, a little more generous in a waiver process that they may have in place versus another school. And that will be specific to each school. So families, you know, may need, if they're concerned about, you know, getting information from the non-custodial parent, you know, it's worth a con, uh, a, a call to the financial aid office at the schools you're evaluating and, and looking at um, applying to and to find out what their process is. Um, because, you know, in the end, that, that, that is still someone who's contributing to college, um, we often get copies of divorce decrees and all that. And, you know, I don't, you know, necessarily want to see all that information, but families, some are very open with what information they're going to share, but we really want to assess the financial strengths of the, again, that family unit, whether or not they're divorced, you know, or, or married, um, or separated, whatever the situation may be. We, we are looking at if we have so many dollars to award, um, again, what is the comprehensive amount that, that the family would be putting together? And then we'll run that through our, our process of evaluating our financial aid awards. And I know I did something recently on the podcast on this, but not everybody hears every episode. So, so if you have two parents and they're married, both parents are expected to submit all their financial information. What we're talking about here is what happens if they are divorced? What happens if they're separated? What happens if they were never married? Well, there's still two parents. Is the yep. school going to still require both parents to submit their financials? And what about if, you know, it can get really complicated. I'm sure you've yeah. seen all, I know all the things I've seen, Aaron, so I can imagine what yeah. you've seen, right? Like, cause sometimes it's just, sometimes it's just, well, the person says they don't want, they won't do it. And there's the whole thing of willingness versus able. And then there's sometimes where, well, I don't even know where the person is. I don't know if they're alive. And so there's all this gray that comes in in the middle here. Yeah. And that's where um, the willingness and able and ability is, is the strong words there, because that is really a tough situation. I will tell you on the financial aid team, because we certainly um, will get calls and, and be kind of listening to the, the family situation. And, and you know, we want to remove ourselves from it because at some point, you know, um, there is that that will that that is, you know, the difficulty of the process is, you know, parent B is supposed to contribute and is choosing not to. And, you know, that it's at some point the schools, we can't, you know, make up the contribution that that parent is going to have, be providing. And that that's a difficult conversation. Um, but, you know, there's there are situations where we can go back um, through professional judgment, which is a term that financial aid officers use to work with families if we're going to adjust things in our calculation for financial aid. So if extreme circumstances do exist, you know, after we've put together a financial aid award, um, you had mentioned, you know, if parents separated, perhaps that was happening during the course of the application process. And, you know, they're asking us to, um, you know, take parent out of the picture and, and providing us with information. You know, there's some things that we can do, um, again, but um, it's within the, the ways in which each school will handle those professional judgment evaluations as well. All right. Let's, talk, let's unpack a really big one because I feel like this is one that oftentimes explains differences, and that is different policies on home equity. Um, can you talk about that and some of the different policies that you'll see, um, especially for institutional methodology profile, because that's fairly standardized in FAFSA, right, with federal methodology. But for institutional methodology profile, this is where I see everything from we don't look at home equity at all to we count all of home equity Till we cap it at four times, three times, two times, 1.2 times income. I mean, I see all of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, explain what that is to our listener and how that could really impact financial aid awards in a major way. Yep. 
home equity, um, one of the biggest differences that you will see in the calculation of a school that uses FM versus institutional methodology, and that FM, again, is the federal side, and the FAFSA is not going to seek those details related to your main home. So that's the one thing that a parent should know. So again, when, when calculating federal aid, that's all excluded. Um, but for schools that are using the profile, it's going to really vary. Um, you've said it best. You've seen it all over the place, as have I. Um, you know, I'm of the, I have a, a college, um, a student who's starting the college process as well. And, you know, as we're evaluating and looking at schools, those are things that, you know, we, we were looking into. But, um, really it's the way I look at it. The home equity is, is, is a, is a financial strength of a family. Um, and it will be up to each school to determine how they're going to assess the strength. And so some, some schools may just use the reported value and then assess in a factor to it. They may decide that um, it's going to be based on a projected value, um, if you don't know. Um, you know, and school A to B could be using 1.2 times your, um, your total income when looking at the value, or school B might use even a higher percentage. And they take that portion of what your, your parental asset is, and that's what impacts your parent contribution in their calculation. And again, they, they, the school want to say, okay, parent, this parent over here is renting, so they don't have any home equity, but this family was able to purchase this asset, has paid it down, has some equity. No, we're not necessarily requiring you to cap that equity. However, we want to use a portion of that asset in our calculation for, for determining institutional dollars. So, that is going to be all across the board. Um, I, I, you know, can't say what school is going to do what. And some schools may decide, you know, we've, um, they may tweak their formula year over year, uh, maybe by looking at what's happening economically as well um, with, you know, the real estate world has been up and down for several years. But, um, or they could just decide, you know, this is our formula and, and we're not going to move from it. But, um I can't say that the trend will stop with using home equity because it's something that, again, it's it's built in that a school can decide on the institutional side how to use that lever one way or another. Let's use an example because I, I, I have a feeling we got a little too weedsy there. So yeah, that's when okay. We talk, yeah, so when we talk about caps, so if you had a family and they're sitting on 700000 of equity, yep. but there was $100,000 in income. If they were using the 1.2 multiplier, which is the most generous number I've seen, I haven't seen anything under that other than the very, very, very short list of schools that don't count it at all. And I think there's less than 10 schools in the country that are in that category. Yeah. So that would mean 1.2 times 100 means, okay, we're going to take $120,000 of your home equity. And that would what typically be at what five percent? Five percent. Yep. And they'll yeah. they'll calculate that and add that to your parent contribution. Right. So your parent contribution is then going to be five percent of that hundred and twenty thousand or six thousand dollars would be that number. Now, if it's another school and we use that seven hundred thousand of home equity, and let's say they're counting all of home equity, well, you can you can think, right? Seven seven hundred thousand times five percent. Now we're talking thirty five thousand. Yeah, just went into the parent contribution versus six thousand. So, this is one of the biggest reasons why I see disparities between aid awards is the policies each school has on home equity. Do you think that's fair? Absolutely, that is um, very fair. And you know, it's um, something we always, uh, or you know, we look at each year as we're making decisions on awarding. But the home equity is is a part of it. Um, but again, as you as we stated, schools will choose how they're going to use that that factor in determining financial aid. So this is a question I have. Not everybody I talk to is transparent when I'm talking about their home equity policies. Is that sort of seen as something that some people just want to keep close to the vest? I've asked schools what multiplier they use, and I've been blown off on that question before. Yeah, um, it's funny because uh, yes, we, we, we do get those questions a lot. And I think schools may be hesitant to share that information because again, it is internal to the awarding decisions. Um, plus, 
or maybe they haven't finalized their decisions on how they're going to apply it. And so not wanting to overspeak. Um, it can be a challenge if the school is using that too in like using a net price calculator and all those things. Sometimes it's not easy to replicate how those things will look when they determine the calculation. So um, there's different levers you can set within our systems and within the application um, to determine how we're going to use it. But yeah, they may, they, I mean, again, for transparency, I mean, yes, it'd be great if everyone would say something and, and how it is being used, but it, it may not be something that they're willing to share. Friends, this concludes this segment of my interview with Aaron Wolf. We hope you join us next week for the next segment. Friends, on Thursday's episode, we'll have two questions from listeners. One was at the round table. And one's with Julia, and you'll have to wait to Thursday to find out. And we'll have part three of five of the interview with David Graves, the deep dive on the University of Georgia. And friends, I want to close you out with a great quote from the great Maya Angelou. I think it's something we all need to think about because we're all in relationships. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. See you on Thursday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Matvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stylianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.